Hello students. Welcome back to my channel, The Goddess of Econ. Today, I will cover the topic of consumer surplus, which all students in an Econ 101 class should make themselves familiar with. It's not too difficult a concept. So relax and please follow follow me. Okay. Suppose a store sells an item that some people like. And for the sake of simplicity, let's assume there are a total of four potential buyers in the market, namely Michael, Jackie, Tito, and Jermaine. Hmm. Seems like we're missing one person here, but let's just focus on the example. Let's further assume that each of the four buyers likes the item, but they have different levels of willingness to pay. For example, Michael is willing to spend as much as $70 on the item, whereas Jermaine is only willing to spend $40 at the maximum, to purchase the same item. So, this means each individual's maximum willingness pay differs as depicted in the table. Let's look at this graphically. If the item were sold at the price of $70, then there'd be only one buyer, namely Michael. So the quantity demanded at the price of $70 is just one. Now if the item were sold at the price of $60, then the quantity demanded would increase to two, due to Jackie grabbing the item in addition to Michael. Similarly, if the item were sold at the price of $50, there'd be a total of three buyers. Lastly, in the case where the item were sold at the price of $40, the quantity demanded would increase to 4, as even Germain, the cheapskate, would buy it. Now let's think about how much the consumers gain at each price level. First, if the item were sold at $70, only Michael would buy it. How much could Michael gain from this trade? Well, he wouldn't gain much, given that he'd pay the price exactly equal to his maximum willingness to pay. So, it doesn't seem he would gain anything. In other words, he'd pay the price that is exactly the same as, the value he has assigned to the item in this case. But then, he wouldn't lose anything either. Now, let's say the price were lowered to $60. Now, there'd be a total of two buyers. Here the second buyer Jackie, wouldn't gain anything, as his maximum willingness to pay was exactly $60. But here, it looks like Michael would definitely gain from this trade. Do you see it? From Michael's point of view, now he can purchase the item at the price of $60, which is $10 lower than the value he has assigned to the item. Therefore, Michael gains $10 from the trade, which can be depicted by the shaded area of the graph. Please note that this refers to the net gain of the consumer, after paying the market price to the seller. Now, let's assume the market price is at $50. At that price, Tito would also buy the item, increasing the total quantity demanded to 3. And at that price, Michael's gain from the trade increases further by additional $10, and Jackie as well benefits from it, gaining $10 for the first time. So, the total gain by all the consumers would equal $30 in this case, which is depicted by the shaded area of the graph. Next, suppose the market price of the item is at $40. What would be the total gain of all of the consumers worth? Here, Michael gains $30 from the trade, Jackie gains $20, and Tito gains $10, with Jermaine not gaining anything, but he is not losing anything either. Therefore, the total gain by all consumers is now $60, which is represented by the shaded area of the graph. So far, so clear, everyone. Now, if we assume a continuous demand curve, rather than a discrete one, then we can see that the total gain of all the consumers at a certain price level can be represented by that triangular area under the demand curve. For those students who don't quite see the total gains as a triangular shape yet, Let's look at the following. Here, the width of the rectangles has been reduced in order to make it more like a continuous demand. Do you see the gains as a triangular shape now? No? Hmm. How about now? I'm pretty sure you can see the triangle by now. So the triangular area under the continuous demand curve represents net gains by all the consumers at a particular price level. And this is known as consumer surplus. Under the assumption of a continuous linear demand curve, calculating the amount of consumer surplus is a piece of cake. Why? Because all you need to do is to simply calculate the area of that triangle. One half times height times base is the formula for the area of a triangle, isn't it? So when the market price is at P star and the quantity demanded is Q star, the consumer surplus can be calculated as one half times P max minus P star times Q star. Here, P max is simply a value of the y-intercept, that is, the price level corresponding to zero quantity demanded. 
Before we part today, let's solve the following consumer surplus problem together, just so that you don't readily forget what you've learned today. Okay, let's assume the inverse demand function is as follows. Price equals 100 minus 4 times quantity. The reason we call this an inverse demand function, rather than just a demand function is because its dependent variable is the price rather than quantity. Normally, we say it's a demand function if the quantity demanded is a dependent variable instead. So the demand curve is in fact, graphical representation of the inverse demand function, not the demand function. Confusing, isn't it? You have every right to blame all the economists who tend to make things vastly and unnecessarily confusing. Maybe it's due to the limitations they possess as human beings, unlike me, who is the divine goddess of econ. Well anyway, here is the instruction. Find the amount of consumer surplus when the market price is at $40. We know that what we need are Pmax, P star, and Q star. Let's obtain them one by one. First, Pmax is simply the y-intercept of the demand curve. That is, the value of P when Q equals zero. You can see from the inverse demand function above that that is just 100. So, Pmax is 100 or $100. Secondly, P star was given by the problem itself. It was $40. Next, we need to find Q star that corresponds to P star. Well, it's not too difficult. We can find the value of Q star by plugging the value of P star in the inverse demand function equation. Here, Q star comes out to be 15. And since consumer surplus is 1 half times P max minus P star times Q star, it can be calculated as 1 half times $100 minus $40 times 15. This equals $450. Simple, wasn't it? And if we depict consumer surplus graphically, we can see that it is the triangular area under the demand curve. So the net gain enjoyed by all the consumers totals $450 in this case. Hope you students have enjoyed today's lecture. The concept of consumer surplus is not too difficult to digest, so I'm sure most of you understand it well now. I plan to explain consumer surplus using calculus in my next lecture video for more advanced level students. So, please do visit again. Don't forget to like and subscribe. May God bless you all.